Uh, the title of my paper is A Synergy Approach to Living Systems, and it's about what I call the synergism hypothesis. Uh, if nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, as the great 20th century biologist Theodosius Dobzhansky famously observed, it's equally true that nothing about the evolution of biological complexity makes sense except in the light of synergy. Natural selection is a clever and immensely useful concept. It provides a general theoretical framework for understanding how life has evolved over the past 3.8 billion years or so. And it's probably one of the best known concepts in all of science. However, it does not provide an explanation for biological complexity, one of the most consequential trends in the history of life on Earth. The arc of biological innovation over time, from primitive one-celled life forms to intricate eukaryotes, multicellular organisms, and finally the emergence of a remarkably intelligent, inventive, and loquacious biped, uh, requires an additional explanatory principle. Over the years, there have been many non-Darwinian theories about this important evolutionary trend. Perhaps the earliest modern theorist, so to speak, to advance the idea of some inherent self-directed trajectory in, toward complexity was the 18th and early 19th century naturalist Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck. A half century later, uh, the renowned English polymath Herbert Spencer elevated the idea into a universal law of evolution uh, that was energy-centered and spanned physics, biology, psychology, sociology, and ethics. Darwin was deeply opposed to such formulations, needless to say. Uh, in The Origin of Species, he wrote, I believe in no fixed law of development. And he repeated that phrase a couple of other times in, in his book. However, Darwin never specifically addressed the evolution of complexity as such, nor even more notoriously the origin of species. Many generations of biology students have learned that Darwin was a convinced gradualist uh, who frequently quoted the popular canon of his day, natura non facet saltum, or nature does not make leaps. Thus, Darwin left it to future generations to explain the evolution of complexity over time. For this reason, many theorists of the post-Darwinian era viewed natural selection theory as unsatisfactory, or at least incomplete. And this has resulted in many non-Darwinian theories over the last 150 years. For instance, the early 20th century so-called theory of emergent evolution was advanced as a way to reconcile Darwin's gradualism with the appearance of qualitative novelties and equally important with the evolution of complexity over time. However, many of these theorists, led by the comparative psychologist Conway Lord, Lloyd Morgan, probably the most prominent of that era, ultimately embraced the metaphysical theology and envisioned and in evolution. Uh, by means of a creative divinity. Uh, far more damaging, however, to emergent evolution theory was the rise of the science of genetics and a more analytical and experimental approach in, in biology, uh, particularly the reductionism associated with gene-centered evolutionary theory. Um, during this period, during much of the 20th century, in fact, uh, complexity was viewed as a kind of epiphenomenon uh, it was, or a non-problem in evolutionary theory. And evolution was focused on the machinations of selfish genes, to borrow uh, Richard, Richard Dawkins' famous phrase. The emergence of complexity theory during the latter part of the 20th century uh, was inspired by new kinds of mathematical thinking and, and, and tools, and it spawned a new generation of non-Darwinian theorists, mostly in biophysics and uh, outs otherwise outside of biology. Uh, in my paper, I cite uh, two prominent examples, uh, the computer algorithm pioneer John Holland and the biophysical bio uh, bio biologist uh, Stuart Kaufman. 
The problem is that all of these theories can be called reductionist in the sense that they rely on some underlying inherent force, agency, tendency, or law that is said to determine the course of evolution or at least shape the evolution of greater complexity independently of natural selection. In effect, these theorists explain away the very thing that needs to be explained, namely the contingent nature of living systems and their fundamentally functional adaptive properties. These theories often seem to be oblivious to the inescapable challenges associated with what Darwin called the struggle for existence in the natural world, and they seem to discount the economic costs and benefits of complexity. Over the last couple of decades, however, complexity has finally emerged as a major theme within mainstream evolutionary biology, and the search has been underway for what the biologist Daniel McShay has called a, quote, grand unifying theory of complexity uh, that would be consistent with Darwin's great vision. As it happens, such a theory already exists. I like to say that it seems that in science, as in politics, there are tides uh, over the course of time. And it seems that the tide has finally reached the flood stage for the theory called the synergism hypothesis, which I first proposed back in 1983 in a book with that title. Uh, what I, the, the synergism hypothesis is, in essence, an economic or perhaps bioeconomic theory of complexity. Simply stated, cooperative interactions of various kinds, however they may occur, can produce novel combined effects, synergies, with functional advantages that may in turn become the causes of natural selection. So the focus of the synergism hypothesis is on the favorable selection of functional holes of different kinds and the combinations of genes that produce those holes. In effect, the parts and their genes that are responsible for producing the synergies may become interdependent units of evolutionary change. That's why I like to refer to it as holistic Darwinism. So it's the functional payoffs associated with various synergistic effects in a given context that constitute the underlying causes of cooperative relationships and complex organization in nature. The synergy produced by the whole provides the proximate functional benefits that may differentially favor the survival and reproduction of the parts. So in effect, the thesis is that functional synergy is the underlying cause of cooperation and complexity in living systems, not the other way around. If cooperation is the vehicle, synergy is the driver. So to repeat, the synergism hypothesis is in essence an economic theory of emergent complexity, and it applies to both the biological and the socioeconomic forms of evolution, most notably in humankind. Uh, just to cite one of my favorite examples, the emperor penguins that inhabit the Arctic are collectively able, and, and they, they gather in large numbers uh, of 10 to 20,000 during the winter months, and they're able to reduce their individual expenditure, energy expenditures by 20 to 50 percent during these long winter months by huddling together, sharing heat, and insulating one another. Without this cooperative behavior and the synergies that result, the benef economic benefits that result, uh, the, the emperor penguins would not survive the winter months. The, the biologists John Maynard Smith and Ursh Sotmari in their landmark 1995 book, The Major Transitions in Evolution, came to the same conclusion independently about the causal role of synergy in evolution, although in a subsequent book they graciously acknowledged the priority of my 1983 book. They applied their version of the synergism hypothesis, although they didn't use the term, specifically to the problem of explaining the emergence of new levels of biological organization over time. Uh, in a separate, <clears throat> excuse me, a 1982 uh, article, Maynard Smith also <clears throat> proposed the concept of synergistic selection, uh, and he illustrated the idea with a formal mathematical model that included a term for non-additive benefits. 
Um, the idea is also expressed in the <clears throat> famous catchphrase, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, which dates back to Aristotle. However, uh, I, I argue that synergistic selection is an evolutionary dynamic with much wider scope even than Maynard Smith envisioned. Uh, it includes, among other things, many additive phenomena with combined threshold effects, like the famous straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, and more important, many qualitative novelties, as the emergent theor emergence theorists emphasize, that cannot even be expressed in quantitative terms. Uh, and, and in fact, there are many different kinds of selectively relevant synergies uh, in the natural world, including synergies of scale, when more achieves effects that that less cannot, uh, the emperor penguins being an example of that, a division of labor, uh, threshold effects, functional complementarities, cost and risk sharing, information sharing, which can have mutually beneficial effects, and of course, animal tool symbiosis, as I like to call it, when tools and animals combine and produce effects that are not otherwise possible. So synergistic selection focuses our attention on the causal dynamics and the selective consequences when synergistic phenomena of various kinds arise in the natural world. And again, it's synergy and synergistic selection that has driven the evolution of co cooperation and complexity over time, including especially the major transitions in evolution. The most recent of these major transitions, as Maynard Smith and Satmari and many others uh, agree, uh, has been the, the transition to humankind. How do we account for the progressive trend over a five to six million year period that resulted in a remarkable evolutionary transformation from arboreal apes to complex technological human societies. Was this simply blind luck or a meandering drunkard's walk, as Stephen Jay Gould, the uh, late biologist, uh, uh, used, uh, uh, termed it, uh, and that, does, that seems to have no particular logic to it, or was there some underlying principle involved? I believe there was an inner, inner logic and an underlying principle, and that synergy and synergistic selection were deeply involved in the trajectory of human evolution. Um, I, I have an entire chapter on this subject uh, in my forthcoming book called Synergistic Selection, but, but very briefly, uh, in, uh, in contrast with the numerous prime mover theories that have been advanced over the years about human evolution, what I call the self-made man scenario proposes that our remote ancestors gradually assembled a synergistic package a remarkable suite of traits that synergistically in cooperation enabled our species to gain increasing control over our own destiny to a degree that no predecessor was able to do. Our ultimate course and trajectory was determined by an accumulation of various forms of functional synergy with economic payoffs for the immediate problems of survival and reproduction in the given context. It was, and moreover, this was propelled by behavioral innovation. In the truest sense, the evolution of humankind involved an entrepreneurial process, a pattern of behavioral invention, trial and error learning, selective retention, and cultural transmission, which in turn <clears throat> shaped the subsequent evolution of our anatomical features. Functional synergy played a key role in this transformation. It involved a variety of immediate bioeconomic benefits for the, those who were involved, all of which were advantageous for survival and reproduction. This package, oops. Okay, I, I just lost the screen here. I'm back. Uh, this this uh, synergistic package <clears throat> resulted ultimately in a, in a threshold being crossed, rather like the achievement of uh, competent flight skills in evolving birds. And this package included efficient bipedalism, highly manipulative hands, 
large and sophisticated brains, numerous tools and technologies, elaborate patterns of social cooperation and organized collective activities, and also a unique capacity to accumulate and use and, and communicate uh, information. Uh, and in time also this led to larger population numbers with additional synergies of scale from, from the larger numbers. And of course, all of these synergies supported and, and, and uh, strengthened one another. Uh, for, for instance, the controlled use of fire provided many different survival-related benefits, but it also required a greater degree of social interdependency and, and cooperation. So, in other words, in effect, we progressively invented ourselves, though there was obviously no premeditated plan. It was new forms of behavior and new synergies that were the, <coughs> were the pacemakers. <coughs> Excuse me. I might just add that this, this self-making hypothesis is not as radical as it may sound. In fact, it's implicit in a number of other current or recent theories related to human evolution. And even Darwin himself in The Descent of Man suggested that learned behaviors, including new food procurement strategies, the invention of tools, and new forms of social, social cooperation played a significant part in our evolution. So he... Uh, Darwin himself recognized the, the role of, of human inventiveness. Uh, it should also be pointed out that for the bulk of this multi-million year journey, our ancestors also followed an egalitarian pathway. They lived in functionally integrated cooperative units shaped by synergistic selection, yet many of the members were unrelated and reproductively in, independent, unlike um, almost all other examples of socially organized species. Uh, and if they were similar to modern hunter-gatherers, they, they also had a, a socially egalitarian policy as a, a, a pattern as well. In effect, uh, our, our hominin ancestral societies were coalitions of families. And of course, finally, the major transition to humankind was unique, also unique in having an evolutionary unit that was culturally based rather than biologically based. And it allowed, it was supported by a unique information system that not only bound the members together, but enabled them to cooperate in ways that would not otherwise have been possible. So in, in all of these ways, our ancestors invented what it amounted to a, a unique new uh, survival strategy. Looking to the future, there it seems to me there's growing evidence that we are now at an evolutionary tipping point, another major transition in evolution. It's evident that for all of our past successes over countless generations, we are now at serious risk of failing to fulfill our prime directive, which is to ensure our collective survival and reproduction. In an increasing number of modern societies, I probably don't need to say this, <laughs> the social contract seems to be eroding or even breaking down. More serious, the ecological underpinnings for the survival enterprise are being undermined. Uh, the UN Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that the current rate of loss are in the entire the uh, topsoil uh, reservoir of the planet will be destroyed within the next 60 years. So we are depleting the means to support future generations at a very rapid rate. And then, of course, there are all the other things associated with climate change. So we are, one way or another, destined to make radical changes. And of course, we may not be the first species to become the victims of our own success. So our next major transition as a species um, is something that is an attainable goal if we purposely plan for it and act on it. But needless to say, that won't be very easy to achieve. Um, the problem is that 
survival, the survival enterprise in humankind has become a global undertaking. And so we have to mobilize ourselves into what would amount to a globe spanning social contract. We have, we need a, a unifying global vision. Uh, like all of the other transitions that have come before us, it's going to involve a new level of organization and cooperation and self government. And it will also foster new forms of cooperation, synergy, and synergistic selection. So the self-made man now has the challenge of evolving into a global superorganism, to use a term that's become quite common uh, in uh, evolutionary biology these days. Uh, the alternative will be growing conflict and social chaos, horrific human suffering, and wanton self-annihilation on a global scale. And it's important to remember that this danger is greatly amplified by the proliferation of nuclear weapons and long-range missiles. In the final reckoning, if our species fails to meet this fundamental challenge, it will squander our evolutionary inheritance and mock the untold generations of our hominin ancestors who struggled to achieve success, successful survival and reproduction over millions of years. In the long run, either we will survive together or we will go extinct separately. The choice is up to us, and it's a choice we cannot avoid making. Thank you.